So we've got a, a really interesting panel here. I'm really excited about it because uh, we've got perspectives really ac across the board um, here. Uh, so we've heard from Mike. We've got Catherine, Travis, Judy, and Brian here from a, a range of, of walks of life here from the ac academic setting to the media setting. And so this is going to be really interesting. Uh, and, and so one thing you know, we want to come back to and, and keep talking about is this reality of just how much content consumption has changed. You know, 10 years ago, if we were talking about captioning content, it was because that's what the broadcast mandate was. That's not the story anymore. So let's start with that. Let's, let's, let's hear from everyone. I want to hear from everyone just very simply, why are you making content accessible? So why don't we start with you, Brian? Sure. Um, well, it's always the right thing to do, right? Um, we have a little belief internally at Netflix that says Netflix for everyone, and so we want to make sure our content is accessible to everybody, um, whether they are have, have sight or they're blind and low vision or, or deaf. So just really important. Um, we make great shows, and we want to make sure everybody can see them. Very basic. Sure. Yeah, we have 24 languages available on our service, and we have audio description available in 13 languages. So um, we're continuing to grow and expand uh, the co types of coverage we do. Um, just to brag a little bit, if I can, since I'm here, um, we have uh, over 530 shows uh, with audio description in the United States alone. Since we've launched audio description in uh, 2015, we've added 5,200 hours globally. Um, about 3,200 plus in the United States alone, 13 languages in the United States alone. And um, you know, well above the FCC requirements of uh, 47 and a half hours per quarter, we add about 320 hours of, per quarter. And also, when it comes to closed captioning and subtitles for the deaf, hard, and hearing, um, we have 100% coverage of our catalog um, in all of our English-speaking uh, countries. And uh, local language subtitles are a requirement for all of our foreign territories as well. Um, I'm at UC Irvine. I've been there for really long time. In February, it'll be 30 years. Um, the beginning of my career there was in the language lab, and everything, we didn't have computers on our desks. Um, everything was very analog. We had cassette tapes and things. Um, but I've always been fascinated by technology's ability to facilitate human communication um, across languages and cultures. And so I moved a few years ago into the Office of Information Technology, and one of the things I was tasked with was supporting our lecture capture system which kind of got me into job-wise needing to support captioning, but it still ties in with this lifelong passion of opening up communication between cultures and worlds and human communication being facilitated through technology in ways that we can all communicate and understand each other better. Hi, my name is Travis Lee. I'm an instructional designer with the University of California Office of the President. And one of my, my main job is to actually work with faculty to design online learning experiences. And my focus right now is how do we better serve people with disabilities in the online learning environment? The reason why I do this is because when I was in middle school, I was diagnosed with a learning disability. And it's been one of my main passions in life is how do we better serve these students? You know, I was going through public school and you know, it was a very rigid model of education. It was not serving my needs as a learner. I had to memorize everything. Mm -hmm. And how do we better serve people with different types of disabilities? How can we create a more diverse way of digesting content? And my, I'm in graduate school right now, and my thesis is really on how in universal, it's actually on universal design for learning. And what I learned is that the best practices for people with disabilities is often the best practices for all types of learners. And creating those different types of learning experiences and more accessible learning experience, experiences helps most students, not just the disabled. Hello, I'm uh, Catherine Carpenter. I'm a professor uh, of health sciences at UCLA. And uh, I teach human anatomy and human physiology. I teach couple other courses, but I was tasked with taking my live classroom and turning it into online coursework. So unfortunately, I didn't have Travis's assistance, so it was a almost solo uh, experience. Uh, like you, I had nothing to go by, so I just created my own way. But just 
in being here today, one of the things that I'm struck by is also to be conceptually accessible. So, and that's been a goal of mine always. And just sitting here, I'm thinking, well, gosh, that's part of it too, because what I'm about is to try and impart pretty scientifically advanced concepts in a form that everybody can understand without compromising the complexity, but to really present it in a way that everybody understands. And I think opening up science and making it an interesting discipline, making it something that we all benefit from, because we do, but we just, so many of us, even the students, they just, you start day one, they tune out. You know, it's boring. So uh, I think we have a big uh, a road to, to walk along, or at least I do, but I'm, I'm just so heartened to hear this concept of accessibility is not just the senses, not just the seeing and the hearing, but the concept, the conceptual part too. Hi, my name is Mike, I'm from Oath. Uh, the, the reason that we do this is really kind of simple. I wish it was more complicated and I had lots of details, but it really starts and ends with users. Users with hearing loss need it, Everyone else benefits, and we want to make stuff that everyone loves. So for us, it just seemed sort of natural and sort of obvious. There's a lot to get you know, to actually doing it and doing it well, but fundamentally, that's really the, the basic reason. So Mike, I think you were talking earlier about the reality that when people go to college, they're not learning this stuff. People, this is a new thing that people are figuring out as we, you, know, you all are especially are figuring out as you go. Um, so, so thinking, or with that in mind, you know, what, what do you wish you had been told, or what, what's some advice you wish you had been given so you didn't have to learn the hard way? So thinking back when you were, were first getting into all this, anyone want to take that? Sure, I can take that. I'm Brian from Netflix, I don't think I interest myself. Hi. Um, I oversee accessibility worldwide for Netflix. Um, so I guess one thing I would have thought, of, I wish I'd someone had told me um, was uh, twofold. Uh, always consider the end user experience and don't make any assumptions. So um, we sort of um, dove right into it, but we, I would have, if I could go back and do it, I would have uh, had more focus groups and understood like what the end user experience really was. And um, I would have uh, worked a little harder to get some language in our contracts that um, holds our partners accountable to deliver that type of content to us. Um, it also forces them and pushes them to organize their content a little better too. So if, if I could go back in time, that's what two things I would do. My answer to that would be, you know, a lot of times we say it's better to ask forgiveness instead of permission. It's kind of the opposite with accessibility. It's so much better to put the work in up front because and build it accessibly in the first place and not have to go back and fix things. It's so much worse to have to go back and try and fix things that you just need to think about it right off the bat. It's gotta be the basis of everything. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. that oftentimes websites and online education sites, they walk down that path too far and it's really difficult to go back in and try to fix it and make it accessible again. Um, but another thing that I, I wish someone had told me was that we should look at, a lot of times, um, faculty, organizations, they'll look at accessibility as a burden because it's expensive to make things accessible. But we should really be thinking of it as an opportunity um, to improve learning outcomes, um, user experience. So I think that that's the big, my big takeaway was that it's, do not look at accessibility as a burden, but look at it as an opportunity. Yeah, I actually would agree with that because I never really understood what it was. And so until I got the three play media captioning and then I saw, you know, what a great job they did and they actually correctly spelled the scientific terminology and they didn't make mistakes. And, and then, you know, we got the whole uh, dialogue, you know, the whole script and uh, I just, uh, I wish that I realized that right away because I thought, oh my God, it's another thing I have to deal with. So I, I saw it as like this big work burden without seeing it as, a, as an incredible possibility. So I appreciate the experience very much. 
I think for me, the, the, the most interesting moment when I was first getting involved in captioning is the quality issues. I really had just thought, well, every company's probably just as good, and captions are either there or they're not, and they're going to deliver them great, and, and what's the hard thing? It's really just getting them there. And my sensitivity to the quality and the synchronization and the availability and the platform issues that make them everywhere they needed to be, was I got a real education in that. And that really informed me in terms of how we wanted to set our own goals and who we worked with as partners. I, I really loved your point about making sure your partners who are providing a video um, are held to that standard as well. And that's something that we're continuing to work on as well. Um, the other thing that I would just add that I wish someone had told me, I just assumed that the video processing part of our company was just golden. And then when I stepped back and realized, they're like everyone else. They have problems and issues and stacks of things they want to fix and, and things they're trying to get to. And so when I said, well, just add captions. It's just one more thing. It's easy. And I realized how that impacted all of these different levels of that whole back-end system of encoding and transferring and syncing and sending and filing and searching. I got a much better appreciation for the difficulty on the technical side in-house, not from the captioning vendor outside. So being ready and be prepared. But for me, that was something that I sort of jumped to a conclusion on. And I had to really go back and get a much better appreciation for how we would fit this into our process in a way, as we talked about in several of the presentations, doing it early, making it lightweight, and not making the, this big last minute giant mountain to climb. So that, that, that appreciation of the internal work, I think, is really interesting for all of you for, in different ways. So people here clearly care, and that's why they're here. But how, are, how do they go back to their office tomorrow and start getting that buy-in? Like how, how do they get other people to appreciate this effort? I mean, how, how have some of you dealt with that to, to get people to see, the, to see that light? And part of it is coming to things like this and just building awareness. Um, you know, part of my job is building more awareness in the entertainment community. Um, I'm often met with curiosity and fascination when I talk about audio description. I think captioning is a mature enough asset right now that that's sort of, in my space, that's just a given. We don't really think too much about it. Um, everybody kind of creates it for their content, and if they're delivering to Netflix, they provide it to us, and we create it internally, obviously, as well. Um, but the audio description, uh, that's an interesting one, right? Because, uh, I mean, a lot of people outside of this space, you know, we, are, we all know about it, but um, people are like, oh, really? That's interesting. What is it, right? Or you see a lot of tweets like, I had it on by mistake. Oh, my gosh. I'm so crazy, right? Um, so the buy-in for me is not so much like a budget uh, perspective, although, you know, it, it does impact our budgets, um, but just like really that education about the broad uses of it. So... Um, well, we've seen some really interesting things is that audio description isn't just for blind and low vision um, uh, customers, but we also see that it uh, really helps uh, people on the autism spectrum really understand uh, what's going on in the program. And interestingly enough, which we didn't even consider, which is always a nice surprise, is that in our foreign markets, you know, we'll, if we have English audio description, we'll let it go live in, let's say, Brazil. And we're seeing in Latin America that there's high consumption of it because, you know, uh, people are using it to understand English. So, um, you know, really understanding like the broad spectrum of all the uses of that asset really helps you get the buy-in and, and uh, you know, talking to the curiosity piece of it also helps too and just understanding the reach in my world anyway. Um, yeah, I'm actually really fortunate right now. I get to work with a lot of faculty one-on-one -on -one and in small groups um, because part of what I do is design new learning spaces. And so in talking about the new learning spaces and talking with the faculty about how to engage their students in working with content inside the classroom, we're bringing up the idea of inclusivity of students on the autism spectrum or other kinds of cognitive um, issues in addition to sensory disabilities and how to make sure that they're included and how students can work with the content in different ways in class where it's really going to be. It's not, oh, they're looking at this at home and I just need to do a thing so they can watch it at home. How are you actually going to interact with these students in class and seeing them on that more human level? And I think that touches them in a different way and makes them understand it more when we talk about the fact that you're going to be working with these students face to face, um, not as a lecturer to 600 people out there in the dark, but really working one on one with them in the classroom or in small groups. How is that going to affect? And to me, that's a really great hook to start talking about the accessibility issues. Yeah, I think that. A lot of the buy-in, you have to, with faculty, I work at UCLA and I work uh, throughout the UC system with faculty, and 
they're used to a, they're, you know, a lot of the older faculty especially are used to a very rigid model. They're, they have a certain way of teaching. And it is tough to get them to break out of that, that, that structure because they've been, it's been successful, it's worked for them in their careers. But if you could show them that, for example, you know, a lot of faculty shoot lecture video. I t try to tell them, you know, do not shoot a 40 minute lecture video and just, just st uh, stream it, you know? So we should break it up into small sections. There's been a lot of research showing that four minutes is pretty much ideal. That after four minutes, the attention span of a millennial is gonna be dropping off pretty significantly. And that helps, that helps students with um, learning disabilities, with, with ADHD, but it also helps pretty much all students. But, uh, so using these guidelines can really help um, just regular students, um, you know, non-disabled students with their learning, as well as captions. Captions help like students who are learning English language learners. We have a huge Chinese population at the UC system, and they all use captions. It really helps with uh, with them with them comprehending the content of the lecture. Those darn millennials. Uh, <laughs> so, Catherine, I think this is now especially interesting because you are on the faculty. Yes, so, so why are you doing it differently? Well, it, it, one of the comments that a student gave me directly was that they were able to use the captions to take notes from. So they would play it and they would stop it and they would they would write it down and they'd play. So the advantage to an online course is that it's not just a one-time event, that they can go back over it and over it again. And the captions really help with that. Even, because I don't think I had any, uh, in, you know, students who, I guess you call it, you know, impaired, disabled, I, I didn't have any. But yet the captions were incredibly valuable. And I, you know, and I just didn't even think that that was the case. I didn't see it that way. And uh, I, it was amazing. So it's a really critical tool now, I think, to all online coursework because that having, and it's not just, you know, non-English, uh, non-native speakers, it's for everybody, I agree, for sure. I, I just wanna tack on that, again, that there's also been a big focus in the faculty on, at UC Irvine and probably also at UCLA, shifting the focus from teaching to learning, and I think that helps frame it as well, that you're helping your students learn. It's not about how you teach, it's not an extra burden on how you teach, it's a way to help your students learn. Yeah. Uh, so at Oath, the way we got by in is we walked into our executive vice president and said, what do you hate, deaf people? No, we didn't, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. Uh, no, it was really about uh, understanding the culture of our company uh, and what we value. And we value, as you saw on that slide, commit to inclusion. We said, this is what that means. This is how we demonstrate that commitment. And that actually was enough in a lot of ways. Um, but we also said, look, there's going to be way more return on this investment than just this particular segment, although it's important in, in its own right. Um, so we talked a lot about um, being able to do search and be able to do personalization, where we understand the kinds of information people want and how to present more like it so they can find more interesting things that they care about. And when we talked about how that's pretty straightforward with search engine optimization on web pages, which at Yahoo, you can imagine, and AOL, like, totally get that. We said, how do you plan to do that on video? And they were like, uh, well, we don't know yet. I said, well, let's talk about how we can do that for you in this new world with video. So it became an opportunity to align with the business. And that's been critical for our success across the board in accessibility is always bringing it back to, it's the right thing to do, we're gonna get huge advantages, but it always, we have to find ways to align it with the business goals. The business goals was a huge investment in video getting more people to consume it, giving people what they wanted to consume, and this helped us search for it, find it, and present it in ways they really could not do in any other way. So um, that had a, a huge effect and that really landed it for us. And then our team, really it was up to us to demonstrate we could do it well and do it with the video team in terms of implementation so we weren't slowing the company down or costing it too much money. So uh, it came back to us to deliver. So, so in this conversation about getting buy-in, it's all come back to the viewers. Right, so we've all just now touched on use cases that are, that are kind of interesting and maybe aha moments in some cases. Is there, if, and if, you know, especially if you haven't already touched on it, is there a certain um, use case or uh, kind of way to explain the benefits that, that may not be as obvious to people that you guys t tend to come back to when you're explaining what you do to pe with, with other people? 
I mean, nothing, nothing that I really haven't touched on um, internally. It's it's uh, it, you know once once you kind of touch on the fact that more people can watch your content, like that's that hits a lot of bells with people at Netflix, but also content creators, right? So um, you know, it's I go to a lot of kickoff meetings where I'm, where we're talking to producers and show creators and. And I'm always like, aha, but we gotta talk about audio description, right? You know? And it's like, well, what's that? And it's like, well, basically more people will be able to consume your show um, or your feature. So um, that is it for me. Yeah, I, don't know, I, I, I did want to touch on this, the power of search functionality inside of transcripts and, and caption files, especially for students who are, you know, they're really pressed for time. The midterm's coming up. They need to know specific knowledge. They don't want to go back all the way through a lecture, but if, if we could implement something like uh, you know, the transcript and doing a keyword search, I can see that being a huge benefit for all college students. And I just want to say, uh, some of the students in my online courses were from other countries, so it was kind of, it was like an international audience. And so they found a direct benefit with the captioning because it made it easier for them to understand the material. I, you know, maybe someday we'll have multiple languages. Wouldn't that be great? But uh, you know, I'm you know expanding every year. This is my second year now. I keep getting more students, so I'm going for an international audience. Why not? So, so that's, that's great. So, so you all are up here because you're pretty progressive in what you're doing. That's why we've asked you to come talk. So, so thinking about that, you know, you've done a really good job. It's not perfect. I don't think anyone would sit here and say it's perfect. So what's one thing that you would like to change? It could be anything. Um, I, well, I'd like to change the two-dimensional nature of the online experience. Because it's not, it, it's, I, how can I, I, I I'm, I'm actually starting to look at, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality as a teaching tool so that not only do you just see it in the two dimensions, but you experience these concepts. For me, I think the, what I'd like to change about uh, higher education is this sage on the stage model, or this lecture model. I think that there's so much opportunity for experiential learning, for kinesthetic learners, for people who, who are learning in different styles, and these opportunities come with technology. And right now, we're just at the beginning. I'm really excited to see what's happening next. And accessibility is one aspect, and it's really gonna be, help a lot of different students um, with different learning styles. So that's one thing that I'm really excited about. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I, what I was thinking about too, is just the, the inclusive aspect of, again, focusing on learners and doing everything that we can to realize the potential of the learning spaces and the content and the delivery methods and everything to really focus on allowing students any path to learn the content and go out and change the world. I guess uh, two things. Um, I'd like to make sure there was more awareness in the entertainment community, which I touched on earlier. And I'd also like to see some more innovation in the creation of captioning and audio description. Um, because a cost is a barrier for a lot of uh, content producers, right? Um, so how can we innovate in this space to bring the cost down? And Mike touched on it a little bit about text-to-speech uh, earlier, and th those are some things that we're working on. But um, like any great effort, it's a collaboration across a lot of communities. Um, so I'd like to always look into brainstorm with folks to see, like, okay, understanding that, it, yeah, it is, it is a creative process in our space, right, to do what we do. And we, don't, we never want to have a sacrifice to quality. We always want the quality to be great. But we, we still want to be able to innovate as it relates to cost because so for some independent film producers, it is a barrier for them. And it's not an unwillingness to do it. It's just, you know, it all comes down to dollars and cents sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting you point that out because uh, if you look at the amount of video that's being produced, the commercial side is represented here, even if it's education, there's a pretty good handle on how to do this. But if, if you look at what the video is in terms of what, what's on the internet, it's almost all user-generated content. It's not commercially produced. It's just us filming our vacations or things that are they're funny or cool or whatever. And to your point about the tools, I would, if I could wave my magic wand, I would love so that every video editing tool in existence had caption prompts so you could type in captions for it and make that something that's so ubiquitous that every student in school who pushes a video up to YouTube or anywhere else 
just goes, well, yeah, how else would you do it? So that captions are just always there wherever they are, and that would help us with tagging and search and a bunch of other things, but that would be my magic wand. I, I also just wanted to say, too, it has not gone unnoticed at our company that Netflix is doing an incredible amount of video description and foreign language content for, for captions. That's raised the bar for us, so that's something we'd like to do yes, a little we, we more do have, we do have captions in foreign <laughs> languages, too. Yes. Korean, even, too. That's our latest yeah. one. So, so yeah. it's they pushing us. It's pushing us, and that's a good thing. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> but yeah, I guess we I guess we we gave Netflix a good a good hard time earlier. I mean, pointing out um, we should point out that that lawsuit was in 2011, so a lot can change in, in a short there was amount a of time. lawsuit? What? That yeah, was... I know, right? But just like Mike, we've gone above and beyond. I think, yeah. right? Oh. So um, you know, there was a certain limitation on that. And I'm not on our legal team, so I don't really want to talk on it. I'm just an operations guy. So my job is to figure out how to make it happen. And, uh, you know, we really leaned in and said, you know, we're, we're not just going to do it for the United States. We're going to do it for every English-speaking country. And then as we, like I talked about earlier, we always have local language coverage in all our, our markets. Yeah, I think it's, as, as someone not at Netflix, it's, it's absolutely safe to say that they have redefined this effort. I mean, they are so far ahead of any other media company uh, when it comes, especially internationally, it, it is really amazing. Um, and, and you could, in one thing to note on that is the quality side, um, and, and they can speak to why quality is so important, and their standards that they've put in place are also above and beyond what a lot of other companies are doing. It's 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 pretty remarkable, and, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, as much as we like to point out the lawsuit, uh, well, I, I also want to add we have a, uh, with social media. There's a very vocal fan base now. So, um, you know, uh, customers have a, a bigger voice in the space now to let you know about the quality of the work. Um, and they certainly let us know. Um, we do have an algorithm that scrapes social media to understand uh, where, the, where the most noise is happening around certain titles and we triage it accordingly. But um, so we're always trying to raise the bar on their quality to make sure that um, you're not taken out of the experience, right? So there are a few comments on the cost and, and the, the effort involved in, in getting this going. So, so let's actually push on that, because I think some people here probably are dealing with the reality of either a small team or no budget. So what, what would you advise someone in that situation where they're getting started, they want to try to make their content, content accessible, but the resources are slim? What, what, what are little things that can be done? I think you just need to start somewhere. Um, we have a, a matrix uh, to prioritize high impact, um, high priority projects and find allies. Because if, if you find someone else who's also interested, it feels like a giant thing that you have to tackle. But if you have a, one or two or three people and you each are doing your little things, pretty soon you're doing more than you thought you were um, and, and you have support so that it doesn't feel like such an ungainly beast of a thing to do. Um, and so even for faculty, particularly online learning, if you're recording videos in the privacy of your own home or office that you're going to be using for online learning, wouldn't it be nice to have a script? Oh, hey, look, automatic transcript, boom. You know, that's an easy place to start. You don't want to just wing it necessarily. Go ahead, type it up. Use that as a starting point as a transcript. That's an easy first step for a faculty member, I think. For 99% of accessibility, best practices are free, I would say. That if I was starting a new company or I was just a basic content creator and I wanted to try to get it out there, I would start with uh, what's called WCAG 2.0 guidelines. I don't know, I know the, uh, it was mentioned earlier in the talk, but just knowing what that is and reading about that, that's a really great place to start, is just knowing what are the best practices and a lot of those best practices are just free. You want to put an alt tag on an image that's descriptive. You don't need any money to do that. So um, outside of captioning, captioning could become prohibitively expensive for some content creators. I understand that. Um, there's machine captions that you could actually update yourself and edit. There's, um, so there's ways around uh, making accessibility prohibitively expensive. And I think that most accessibility is free, and it's just about what you know. And start with WCAG 2.0. Um, yes, I agree with you. I started basically with no budget, and uh, I had Camtasia, I had my laptop, and I had a cam and a microphone. That's all I needed to create 
the content. Before we found Three Play Media, we were I was going to do Dragon Naturally Speaking while I'm recording, and you know, put that up. So, uh, so that, that you, you can do quite a lot with very little. So, and and also with not a lot of people either. I mean, my uh, uh, IT uh, uh, collaborator helped me. You know, we helped we solved problems together. That's how it worked. But basically, it was the two of us and a little other help, and that was it. So there was no money. Um, yeah, no, there are some good free tools and things. Uh, we're a firm believer in creating a hero. So in our case, the hero was Saturday Night Live. Our whole company had just bought the rights. It was expensive. It was being featured across all of our properties. Uh, everybody was marketing and talking about it at the time. It was exclusive to our company. Um, and so we poured ourselves into that one thing and said, if we're going to do captions, let's do it for that. Let's make them great. Let's make our video player great. So that forever onward, we could say that's how it should be for everything. We needed something to point to, and we needed to help the company know they could do it. And so pick something that's big, or at least even if it's small, that just represents great work. And then you can use it as a reference or point to it or say, this is how we got that done. It becomes your starting point for everything else that happens later down the road. That worked really, really well for us. I want to add one thing. Another really great place to start if you work at a university is just to go visit the Office of Students with Disabilities or Accessibility Office. Go talk to the students, see what's working for them, what's not working for them, and just kind of see how they're interacting with the technology. I think that's, a, that's such an important aspect to becoming a better designer. Um, so that's a, a free method to making your course more accessible. Yeah, that's true. UCSF has a really good um, digital accessibility website. And one of the early things they did was record one of their students using a video, recorded them using a screen reader on a website that was not accessible. And they just put that video up there to show, like, this is what it's like for, and that made a huge impact on a lot of faculty. And I show that video to people for the same reason, just to show that like, these are, this is what's going on. That's not fair, um, and that we need to be equitable and provide access. For, for me, I would say, um, you know, we actually don't have an accessibility team at Netflix, so we have just people who are super passionate about the space, and they all carve out time from their day jobs to sort of push these initiatives forward. Um, so it's not a top-down kind of thing. It's a really bottoms up from our company. And, when I was putting the team together, I was just socializing it, and you'd be surprised about how many people are impacted in, in this world uh, about disabilities. And I, so people were very eager um, to work on this, and that you know that makes it even easier, right? So you're 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 really getting buy-in at that passion level. Um, and as Judy was saying earlier about like the the allies, it's so important to have allies in this space, right? And we have so many allies outside the the um, our business that are also doing amazing and wonderful things in this area as well. So just being aligned with them on, you know, where we're at, what are next steps, how can we innovate a little bit more. Um, you know, some of the things, like I was talking about, we're, we're, we're really trying to um, innovate in the space in that text-to-speech area. You know, we're, we're partnering with Amazon there to, on their poly system to help us create really great quality voices. Um, so the, the quality is great, but the, the access is cheaper. Awesome, so we're gonna open it up to some questions. Sure, when you talk about um, making access cheaper, the other way to do it would be to get other people to pay for it within the organization. I'm wondering what your deliverable, specifically for Netflix and Oath, is to the rest of the organization to make that text searchable. So they're not gonna work with the .sec file. Are they working with CCSLs? Are they working with Word doc? The transcripts, how do you get that to turn into SEO and searchability or recommendations and, and so forth? Thanks, yeah, so uh, it turns out every time you ask for captions, you get a transcript. Most people don't know that. So it starts with a transcript, then it becomes timed text, and then you get your formats coming back to you. And with Replay, we get tons of those different formats. So we have the transcript, we can embed it in the page to create SEO. We can keep it separately, we can tag it if we want to, we can take out keywords, like there's a whole range of things we can do once we have that basic text. And when I explained that, that that middle step is transcript, before we get captions to our engineers, they were like, oh my gosh, you get what? So it was really straightforward. And then the cost thing turned into a, if I can't do it any other way, then 
the cost is the cost. Like that's the only way for me to get this advantage. So it becomes sort of a distinctive for the company, and we have some interesting plans going forward of how to use that in innovative ways that might differentiate us. So um, that turned out really well. For us, we just have metadata tagging, you know, upon delivery that says what the file is, and with our tools internally, it routes it to the right location and it makes it display correctly. I mean, to put it simply, I know you're a bright cove, so you probably could we could go we could go deep on this, but for the room here, I'll keep it fairly simple that it's, uh, it's all about tagging and our internal tools read the tag and it shows it where it needs to go. No, not for audio description or captioning, no. I have something to add here. Um, so with, with certain video players, there's integration with the captioning services and there's, there's so much integration with, with, within online learning with what's called LTI, which, which it, it marries these two, these two different platforms and through the LTI we also grab the captions. And so through the player itself, we could actually have a search bar inside the player um, that you could search the transcript or the caption files directly, and then it, would, it could bring you to that point in the movie. So I, I could see that a lot of it is going to be solved itself through the integration between video players and the caption files. Other questions? <coughs> this may sound a little crazy, but in the next level of captioning or accessibility, is there a way that we could integrate maybe the vibration or haptic feedback or the devices so that when we hear the music, it's not just, you know, ominous music that we describe, but you actually have the kind of vibration that kind of gives that sense. I think that would be really awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time I heard that, so yeah. yeah. Fully aware, yeah. We are working on some second screen applications too, so um, what we like to call co-viewing. So for example, my mother-in-law is deaf, right, and uh, I have um, a relative that has uh, Asperger's as well, right, and also have um, some foreign language people that are really close friends of mine. And uh, if, you're, if I'm sighted and I'm sitting in a room with someone who's blind, if you're watching Netflix currently and they want to hear audio description, we both have to hear the audio description, right? So we're working on ways so that if you, with fingerprinting, your device is able to pick up that track and through your, your second screen, you, you know, put your earphones in and you'll, you'll just get the audio description track while I'll get the, the rain, uh, the regular audio. That's a lot of work to be done there, but that it will be coming at some point in the future. Okay, so to the haptic thing, it's coming. I know somebody who is totally invested in that, and they are coming with some hardware to produce something. Uh, it's every haptic feedback thing is in beta for blind people and deaf, but it's coming. Uh, can't tell you anything else. <laughs> so, uh, just want to say, um, three play, you're awesome. And then second, um, Netflix. It's so great that there's a little section that says audio descriptions, and when you double tap it. You get nothing but all your audio description videos. Me and my blind friends, we love that. That's the best thing that has come out so far, uh, uh, other than the descriptions. Uh, so second, um, I would like some clarification. Do we call it DVS, AD, or DV? What should we say? I think everything is fine, and depending on where you go, they call it something else. So we call it audio description. That's how it's listed on our service. But you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, and it's all, yeah, it's you'll all hear the same, everything. it's fine. Audio description, yeah. video description. Everybody knows what you mean, right? So it's fine. All right, I asked just because AFC says, uh, I've seen D, someone that told me there's a DV on screen, and then another theater has 80. It's a little crazy. Yeah. Agreed, yeah. So it is on the 508 roadmap. So like the, the audio description is going to become the law soon. And it, I, I feel that hopefully the prices will come down at some point. Right now, it, it's, it's pretty expensive. And um, we haven't implemented it yet, it, 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 at least in my courses in the UC schools. But it's something that I'm really interested in doing, because I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, and, and just so everyone understands what that DVAD, we're talking descriptive video versus audio description, it all kind of comes back to the, it's the same idea. There, unfortunately, the, the nomenclature has not been standardized quite as well as, as some other features, but that, that's what uh, was being discussed there. Um, but I think one thing that was really interesting that was just brought up about this idea that you can search on the described videos only. So, so that gets to this issue of awareness for the viewer. Like, how, how do you guys go about making sure that whether it be students or viewers, they even know that this is available? 
That, that is one of the challenges, and I, and I would readily admit that even where the audio description gallery, we call it our gallery, is on our site is not even all that accessible, right? You kind of have to navigate to the bottom of it. It's not all that great, to be honest with you. But it, with, uh, our site does work with screen reading technology, so if you navigate around, you'll eventually find it. I know the ACB is pretty good about promoting where to find it, too, on our, on our site, too. So another ally that help, that's helpful there. Um, but that's for us, it's all about making our, it's not just about making our content accessible, but also our, our site accessible. So we work very closely to make sure that screen readers can get it, and we're always looking to um, really innovate in that space as well. Um, so, you know, we get those questions all the time. You know, if, if I'm blind and low vision, how can I just get, when I land on the page, how can I just get titles that are described? So things we're always considering for sure. I really think that good design should be seamless and invisible where like so if, if this tool is available or this or uh, the service is available it should be obvious to the person uh, for example like iPads like two-year-olds are using that that's a good design that means that you don't need to think too much to understand how the how the operating system works and I hope that in the future accessibility will be the same way you don't need to search around for the for the page that describes how to access this in an accessible way it should just be seamless it should be there and the person should know exactly where it is intuitively. So Travis just totally destroyed my dreams. I thought my two-and-a-half-year-old was a genius for knowing how to, <laughs> how to turn everything on and off, but I guess not. Other questions? There we go. Um, so I'm curious, are there any plans um, to look into uh, VR being accessible, uh, virtual reality? Yes. <laughs> but I can't say what right now. No, we actually, part of Oath is this company called Riot Labs, R-Y-O-T. They do augmented reality and virtual reality. They do both content creation and technology development. And as I mentioned, we're just now a couple of months in, in integrating all of these things together, but we have very grand ideas about what to do in that space. More to come. I, th I think it comes back to, that, again, that's, uh, those are new technologies, so it's building awareness about what the, what the benefits that VR and augmented reality bring to the space, right? So it's, I think it's very early stages and everybody's still trying to figure it out, but hopefully at some point, once it's understood, that accessibility will follow. I'm, I'm personally really excited about virtual reality. You know, I grew up in, in, in the 90s and it was kind of the transition into the age of the web. And so like the web is what changed our lives. And it, for our children's lives, it could be virtual reality. There, and it could make a huge impact on people with disabilities, people who were not able to travel, people who are not able to do certain things, but can experience it now through virtual reality. So I think that the virtual reality space is gonna be a really exciting space for people with disabilities. I don't know exactly how it will, it will best serve them. It's a brand new technology, but I could see the potential there right now. I'll just add to that, because you, you brought something to mind. There's really two pieces to this we need to keep in mind. There's both the content you experience when you're in an augmented reality space or virtual reality space, which needs to be accessible and whatever that means, lots of exploration to be done. But it's also then making the devices that enable you to experience it accessible. So if you're using goggles, do I have to press a button on the goggle or do I have another way of using a switch or a speech or something else? So there's two halves of this problem, both need to be addressed and there's a whole open field of opportunity. Uh, so I had a similar question to what was just asked, uh, except instead of virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, and that is for uh, kind of mainstream movie providers. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we can walk in with a, with a headset that could pick up uh, a silent track that either puts captions right on the screen or has an overlay uh, on whatever we're watching with additional information or even the, uh, the uh, audio descriptions or something like that. Um, Brian talked about uh, multi-screens. Well, one of those screens could be a, uh, an AR headset, uh, which, uh, which allows for somebody in the room to put on a pair of glasses and see the audio descriptions while the person sitting next to them does not have that capability, doesn't see what's on the screen. And then if you want everyone in the room to see what's on the screen, then you could just turn it off for everyone. We talked earlier about the gym. When you walk into the gym and you see the captions on the screen, but you could, there are other things you can do for, for those kinds of uh, 
situations. And Catherine mentioned using um, uh, AR and VR for teaching and, and how to incorporate that into a, a teaching environment. And we have real-time transcriptionists that sit in classrooms and, and type different things up. Um, and uh, using the AR technology to, could have it overlay. Uh, so there is much more to be seen in this, in this particular market. Um, for you guys, the panelists, have you thought about using AR in any way? Yes. We are we are not looking at that right now, actually. So I'll be clear about that. It's not something we're we're focusing on our core business right now to making it our, our content accessible to as many people as possible in the formats. In yeah, I've I've thought some about it, and one of the things that um, I like to do in my classes is I like to I, I explain a biological phenomena, and then I explain something that everybody knows. So like I talk about the heart and I talk about the elasticity of the blood vessels and then I talk about playing tennis and the recoil of the racket. And so if I could all of a sudden bring in tennis playing as a way to illustrate what happens in our blood vessels with this recoil and how the recoil helps our circulation. It, it you know, it, it kind of supports the heart rate or supports the heart pumping with this recoil. So in other words, I would just bring in somebody playing tennis and somebody in the racket going back and forth and how that pushes the ball in the other direction. And to me, that would just completely drive home the concept. So that much better than just in a two-dimensional way. We're, I mentioned the accessibility lab, so I'll just give you a really brief anecdote. Um, and this is a really baby step, but it at least gets you the idea that we're invested in this. Um, in the lab, we have goggles that are color lenses for red and green color blindness. And they're mechanical welders goggles. They're really simple. And we've been using these things for years. They are the state of the art. Pretty bad. Most people don't know that 7 to 8% of the population is red-green colorblind. That's a new thing for most designers. They're like, what? I, well, I'm using green to mean up and red to mean down. That's bad. Yes, it is. We need to use other symbols and things to go with that. So we use that as an introduction to uh, our designers and engineers. Um, but they can't take them home. We only have two, and only two people in the lab of 30 can use them at a time. So we worked with an outside company prior to, to getting Riot Labs, uh, um, uh, Thea Immersive in the UK, and they developed uh, a free app you can download today called Eyewear. It's on I iOS and Android, E-Y-E-W-A-R-E. -E and it is a vision simulator. So in our lab, we have the cardboard, the Google Cardboard spec, these viewers, and we have every person download this app, and in the lab, we have them load this, and you look through it as if it were glasses. But by tapping on the screen through this cardboard viewer, you can change your vision. It doesn't replace, it doesn't make you blind or colorblind or have glaucoma, but it helps you, as we say, ask a better question. So when you do encounter a user, you say, what is it like? You start to at least be able to ask a better question and get more information. So this is great for us because it allows us to let them take it home and share it which raises that awareness, which we've been talking about, and give people a better sense that there's other people in the world that do things differently than they do and perceive the world differently and interoperate with the world differently. So it's a really cool thing. It simulates macular generation and glaucoma and retinitis pigmentosa and color blindness and all these different things. And um, the cardboard viewers are, you know, six bucks or eight bucks or something. They're really easy and they work with everything. Uh, but that's a great example of using AR practically in a real way today to do something we could not do otherwise. So a baby step, and we have some, as we said, grand ideas, but it's a really cool start. And the perception of that's been really cool. And it's generated some really good, interesting conversations about what vision loss means, because it's not just blackness if you're blind. Like, there's variations in there, and that helps to explain that point. I think we've got time for two more questions. I wanted to know how do you, well, okay, what, what is the cost for that kind of accessibility, the, the auditory description? Is it expensive or I'm just wondering? That was my first question and then I have another one. So I'll, I'll speak to it in my space. So um, 
when it comes to describing uh, film and TV shows, it's an entertainment uh, content. So um, it's, it is a creative process, right? So one thing that we, we have found it hard to sort of automate and innovate in is that you still need someone who understands how to write good audio description, write a script to describe the content of the film, right? Um, so that, 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 that is a time process. There's not really, you know, that's a labor. Someone has to do it, someone with skill and experience. Um, and then there's the recording of it as well. So then you have to get into a recording studio. There's time for that. You have to hire a narrator who understands how to do it, who, uh, you know, tries to capture the tone and the pace of the content you're watching. Um, so I, I can only speak to my space that it, it, it is, and that's going back to, like, you know, cost is a barrier for a lot of people because, you know, it is like making a dubbing asset in a, in a sense, right? Because um, you have to have all the requirements there to, like, create a, a, a dubbed asset. So it can be um, fairly um, pricey, and um, the, it ranges depending on who you're doing and time and stuff like that. But there's plenty of uh, companies out there that can that do it, and you're, maybe one of them is here right now today. Um, you can talk to them afterwards about what the price is for that. That's, that's it for me. Yeah, the other trick to that is you're fitting that description in whatever blank space in the audio track there is. So if it's three seconds between speaking parts, that's the three seconds you have, and you've got to fit something in. If there's 20 seconds, you get a little more time. So there is quite an art to figuring and, out how to, much can I say in the time that I have. And to even add, when we, when we provide, um, let's say, English audio description for a Spanish language uh, film, so now we have to get another narrator that, trans that uh, speaks the subtitles, right? So we'll have a narrator saying what's happening on screen, and then when the, if there's subtitles appearing, another narrator will come in and read the subtitles. So now you're paying for two people to come in and do the recording. So you know, depending on the complexity of the, what you're trying to describe, the cost can vary. Narcos is a good example. Watch it only on Netflix. OK. Hey, wait a minute. Okay, so my other question is um, related to accessibility um, and education. Um, as uh, professors or uh, with students or, you know, uh, students that have dif di different disabilities, deaf, blind, learning disabilities, really all of them, um, some have all of those in one student, um, what kind of approach do you take to providing accessibility for that kind of student or to each, for each of those disabilities? I, I could speak to this a little bit, is that um, there, uh, there's a methodology called universal design for learning where it tries to hit as much different learning styles and as, as many different uh, disabilities as possible. Um, unfortunately, right now, at least in the traditional classroom and online learning environments, oftentimes people with um, different disabilities or a variety of disabilities, they, 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 we cannot serve them right now, but we have to send them to, to what's called accommodation, where they work directly with the individual who could help them through that path. But ideally, we should, we should be able to serve those people in the online environment without the accommodation. So we, we're not quite there. But I think that in the, in, in the future years, we could, we could move in that direction. And there's so many different ways to serve those students. Uh, I don't want to get into all of them, but, is, but if you would use the WCAG um, standards, you, you'll be on your way to get there. I know at Irvine, we um, have had a very decentralized approach in the past. And just within the last year or two, we now have an accessibility work group on campus that has everything from purchasing to student affairs, um, the libraries, everywhere. We have representatives from all over campus. And we just, this week, finally launched our high-level domain accessibility.uci.edu website that covers IT accessibility, physical accessibility, resources for faculty, staff, students, and visitors to the campus with all of the information in one place. Um, our Disability Services Center is, is there for students for accommodations, but we're also just trying to make the information as findable as possible um, by using this high-level domain and not wondering, does, what does this department do or what does that department do? We finally have it all in one centralized location, and it looks like it's a priority for the campus, which is great. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I know as an individual professor, uh, what, I, what I believe in is having a level playing field for every student in the class. So every student in the class has to have the equal opportunity to succeed. And that isn't always um, sensory, sometimes it's economic, sometimes it's uh, all kinds of different reasons. Uh, but, you know, I can, I can the, the students that I've had, I had one student who was sight impaired, and so her, ex, her uh, written exam, I, I, I created a special version for her with really large text. And she sat right in the front, and I made sure that she was, could see the lecture material. I've had other students who were hard of hearing, and so they would sit at the front, I would record the lecture, they could take it home and turn up the volume. So uh, I believe UCLA has the same thing, but it's also up to the individual professors and their philosophy, and I've always firmly believed in leveling the playing field, whatever it is. So I think we're out of time. So thank you very much. Uh